I'd like to provide you a look at the human impact of immune therapies. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask you for a second, if you wouldn't mind, to engage with me in a little emotional role play. I want you, if possible, to just close your eyes for a few seconds, and we're going to talk about your health. And I want you to imagine for a second what's the worst thing you can think of that can happen to you next year health-wise. What do you dread the most? Okay, you can open your eyes and we can talk about that. Is it you or a loved one having to face a life-threatening cancer? Is it one of your children suffering from a debilitating autoimmune disease? Or is it a new pandemic that arrives without warning, sweeping across the continents and affecting your entire family? Well, what do all these frightening nightmares share in common? Well, for one thing, it's that we take for granted something that I think uh, we all need to think about deeper, and that's the value of good health. I think it often takes a challenge to our own health, uh, such as a, a, a disease, to really, I think, really value it. But more importantly, and fortunately, all of these challenges that I went through are now able potentially to be successfully addressed. How? How can they be addressed? Well, now, today, all of these are amenable to treatment with immunotherapy. And this is rather remarkable. I think immunotherapy really is defined as the ability to take substances that can either uh, improve or suppress targeted cells or the immune system in general to make it better able for our bodies to fight infectious diseases, cancer, other diseases. There's actually not a field right now that's more exciting. We're seeing a great research investment now in immunotherapy, uh, partners between academia and industry, a lot of new diverse classes of, of immunotherapy drugs to treat cancer. Likewise, we're seeing an increase in understanding of how best that we can deliver these drugs and how we can monitor real time their responses. I think it's safe to say in the future that syringes and pills may actually become obsolete. You're going to see a vast new array of treatments for all sorts of diseases that really have never been seen by any generation previously. Well, how is the University of Arizona going to take advantage of these exciting opportunities? Well, our university has embarked on a bold new initiative called the Center for Advanced Molecular and Immunotherapies, or CAMI. CAMI is based on two core principles. Number one, the body's best defense is its own natural immune system. And number two, precision medicine promotes and improves treatment outcomes. CAMI is built collectively so that we're best able to tackle the, the amazing challenge of unlocking the power of our immune system to treat disease. Well, how did immunotherapy actually get started? Uh, over the years, the mainstays of cancer therapy have been surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. But over the last decades, we've seen the emergence of other new therapies like immunotherapy that are really beginning to come to the fore and are often called the fifth column of cancer therapy. Now, like immunotherapies, like any type of cancer therapy, the end result and where they all roads lead to clinical trials. This is silver. Silver holds three degrees, a BA, a master's, and MBA from the University of Arizona. In, in 2016, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he was told he had three months to live. Silver is a Vietnam veteran, a, a Navy pilot, and he actually was shocking news to him because he'd never in his whole life had a serious disease. He'd never even had any broken bones or other injuries. Uh, he sought care at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, 
and he was offered the standard conventional treatment plan. Started with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and Whipple surgery in 2017. Then that was followed by mop-up chemotherapy. This did well for him until last year when the cancer recurred with metastatic disease to his lung. This is when his physicians, knowing that conventional therapy had failed, offered him an opportunity to enroll in a clinical trial. He started that clinical trial, and since then, all of his lesions in his lung have not only regressed, but cavitated, and many can't even be detected anymore. So seven years after diagnosis, silver is now deemed cancer-free. This is remarkable. And ironically, for this Navy airman who was once stationed in Antarctica, and his job was to fly researchers across the continent, this most recent uh, potential life-saving treatment came from something he vowed he would never participate in, a clinical trial. Head and neck cancer accounts for 4% of the cancers in the United States. It's a devastating disease. This is also because some of the treatments, including chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, can lead to very lasting effects that impair functions that are really unique to our humanity, such as speaking, eating, and facial expansion. This is Barbara. Barbara, in 2015, was finding a little painful to eat and drink. She noticed that she had a white spot under her tongue. She went to the doctor and was referred to a otolaryngology specialist. She thought at the time this was just a canker sore under my tongue. Turned out to be cancer. And over the next two years, she underwent a number of treatments, including removal of part of her tongue and the floor of her mouth. Despite this, the cancer was progressing. She was losing the battle. Uh, at this point, I think everyone was, she was in a very difficult place. This was very deflating to Barbara and very worrisome for her physicians. She started on a immunotherapy trial with a new targeted agent. This was in 2018. Five years later, she is now completely cancer-free. In fact, six months after starting that immunotherapy, she was deemed cancer-free. Well, I'd like to share another type of interesting therapy now and its effects on things besides cancer. And that therapy is chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, or CAR T-cell therapy. You may have heard of it. CAR T-cell therapy is an immunotherapy that uses patients' own cells that are then genetically modified in the lab and given a gene for a receptor, a chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR, which is then specifically tuned to a cancer cell antigen. Patients' immune cells, T cells, are removed, taken to the lab, treated, and then re-injected. Now, this is really revolutionary for a number of different cancers, but at CAMI, we're going to be looking at a variety of other diseases, including autoimmune disease. This is Taylor. Taylor is a second-year medical student at College of Medicine, Phoenix. Although all her life, she's felt sort of like a teacher explaining to people about autoimmune disease. For as you see, Taylor, when she was very young, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. She'd go to uh, birthday parties of her friends, and the parents would ask, why are you not eating certain snacks? And she would go on to tell them about the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, as well as things she did every day in terms of calculating and monitoring her insulin levels. When she was an undergraduate, she went to a counselor at her school, career counselor, to plot out the best path to go to medical school. When asked what was unique about her candidacy for medical school, Taylor outlined her autoimmune diseases, including type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, Hashimoto's disease, and hypothyroidism. She was astonished when the career counselor said, well, these seem to like obstacles to me, then maybe you should think about a different career path. Taylor was not deterred. She was accepted to the College of Medicine, Phoenix, 
And she is also awarded a scholarship by the University of Health Sciences Primary Care Health Scholarship Program. And now, CAR T therapy, like you just saw, is being focused on many autoimmune diseases just like Taylor has. Let's move on to infectious diseases and what immunotherapy can do for that. You, of course, know about the pandemic immunology and its role in, in conquering the pandemic. But this is Brian. Brian works in my office at UHS. And this is his dog, Sparky. Both Brian and Sparky have valley fever. As you know, uh, valley fever is something that's endemic in Arizona. Valley fever thrives in wet soil and human lungs. When it rains, the fast-growing fungus coccidioides uh, spreads in the wet soil like mold through bread. Valley fever in the, this fungus requires moisture, and it flourishes after a rain. And then as things dry out, it stagnates. But the spores of this fungus remain in the topsoil. Uh, this is one reason, I think, that after a heavy rain and, and then the dry out period where the growth stagnates, that these spores then can be lifted up by wind and carried to new places. Many people feel that that's one of the reasons that the projected spread of valley fever is from our area here in the southwest all the way up to the northwest. And investigators and experts at the University of California, Irvine, suggest that if high temperatures continue and that drought persists, that valley fever will end up as far north as the U.S.-Canadian border and as far northeast as North Dakota. It currently resides in 479 counties in the West. Well, I think uh, if you live in an area that's endemic uh, or just vacation in an area that's endemic to valley fever, you too can get valley fever. It's easily inhaled, the spores, and it's something that healthy, uh, any healthy mammal, human or animal, can, uh, can get. This is, uh, I think, something that in fact, experts say that the, oh, if you spend time outside, out of doors, most of the time in the dusty areas of the Southwest, uh, unless you were to get vaccinated against valley fever, there's no way you could stay uninfected. Unfortunately, there's no vaccine available for valley fever to date. I think uh, if there were, this would be absolutely the strongest pillar in our armamentarium. Professor at the University of Arizona, John Galgiani, uh, who is director of the Valley Fever Center for Excellence at the University of Arizona, was very interested in developing a vaccine for Valley Fever. And the first place he just started to explore this was in animals, in dogs. As you know, dogs root around the environment with their nose and can inhale massive amounts of spores uh, in a short period of time. And in fact, the frequency of a dog getting valley fever is much greater than a human, and the symptoms they get would be much worse. Now, dogs, as I mentioned, often are infected, and when they get infected, it's often disseminated disease. We know it affects the lungs, but in dogs, it also affects the eyes, uh, bones, and the nervous system. In fact, disseminated disease, such as you see here, occurs in about 25% of the dogs who come uh, for, for, to present uh, to the veterinarians. This is much more than in humans. So in looking at what to do for a dog, we actually look at corn. This is uh, a disease that's caused by cochleobolus. Uh, cochleobolus affects corn and basically all cereal grains. It's a fungus, and it has a gene called CPS1. And this gene is very important for cochleobolus uh, to cause disease in these cereal grains. It turns out that coccidioides has a gene very similar to CPS1. And researchers at the University of Arizona took this gene uh, out and inserted a delta gene of CPS, one that was not effective uh, in causing disease. Now, as we know, uh, we have to try this in animals before we try it in humans, and that has been done. 
uh, the vaccine uh, with Delta CPS1 was first tried in mice and caused no disease. In fact, even after challenging these mice with 25 million spores, and even in mice who had no immune system, they did not develop coccidioides. This then, with similar results in pigs and dogs, suggested that this vaccine was very safe. And now it's being tried and used all across Arizona and through a partnership with a veterinary supply company that would license the technology from the U of A, Anavive. It's being used and its spokesman is none other than U of A's Rob Gronkowski. Now, this vaccine that John Galgiani helped to produce has already proved itself. So he's moving on to humans. And we hope to see a vaccine in, in the future that will actually protect all of us. But in any event, uh, this is personal to me because everything you've heard me talk about, all these diseases, I have. I have pancreatic cancer. I'm being treated for prostate cancer, another cancer. I've had autoimmune diseases, including Hashimoto's thyroiditis and vitiligo. And I've had valley fever, not only in my lungs, but in a bone in my pelvis. So. This is personal to me, and like many others, that's why I feel so strongly about the potential for immunotherapy, because I was helped by it. So I want you now to go back to where we started, briefly, and think about those things we talked about in our little meditative exercise, and how we can envision Cami making a difference. Uh, so let's think about that. Number one, let's think about you are a loved one with a life-threatening cancer. Uh, this is something that I think is, is worrisome to all of us because we fear maybe the uh, debilitating effects of the therapy more than the disease itself. But I think immunotherapy is going to present new opportunities that hold the promise to change how we treat cancer. And that's by generating tr drugs and treatments that really will depend on a patient's distinctive immune system and their unique cancer features. And Cami's going to produce these drugs, I have no doubt. And these are going to be used in phase one clinical trials. We're actually going to have a production facility in this Cami building that will make these vaccines and drugs to treat patients uh, and hopefully with less side effects and allow them to thrive throughout their treatment. Number two, let's think about what we mentioned in terms of a loved one or a child with a debilitating autoimmune disease. 40 million people in the U.S. suffer from 80 known and incurable autoimmune diseases. If you have an autoimmune disease, as you imagine, this is your body fighting against itself every single day. Your defense system can't really differentiate between your own cells and foreign cells, so it mistakenly attacks normal cells. Research is going to help the body gain control over this fight. And CAMI is going to produce new therapies that are going to be able to specifically address components of the immune system to really allow us to uh, treat diseases like multiple sclerosis, lupus, type 1 diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and Hashimoto's disease. And finally, uh, think about pandemics, a new pandemic arising out of nowhere with no warning spreading across the continents. Uh, but this time, CAMI-led research will have new tools that it's created at the ready. So public health organizations will be able to have early diagnosis and effective treatments this is something that I think we all look forward to and something that I think is the promise of immunotherapy. So I'd like to close in saying what I like to think about is as we challenge the best of today, we really, I think, create new standards for tomorrow and advance these standards forward. This is our goal and our hope for CAMI. Thank you very much.